Hey everyone, we know how hard it can be to keep up with the latest news, so if you haven't had time to stay on top of what's what in the Holy Land with ILTV, have no worries. Stay tuned for our weekly review where we'll give you the scoop on the biggest stories that you may have missed in the last seven days, right from Tel Aviv. I'm Aaron Porras, and thank you for joining us. The IDF is now entering day three of Operation Northern Shield, and thankfully the calm is holding despite the high state of alert. The plan to find and destroy terror, terror group Hezbollah's attack tunnels into Israel is far from over, uh, as it's still projected to last at least several weeks to a month. The tunnels, which were revealed by the IDF earlier this week, lie below nearly 100 feet of limestone and are complex both in their design and reach. Destroying them is no simple task. Collapsing the tunnels, for example, could affect the land and even potentially communities above on both sides of the blue line. And the heavy rains now beginning to fall in the region also pose bumps in the road. Finally, aside from the physical issues with demolishing the tunnels, there's still the threat of war to consider. For now, Hezbollah has made it clear that it's watching closely the situation, but it's unlikely that they'll start hostilities as long as the operation stays in the Israeli Golan. Lebanon's Prime Minister Hariri also said that there was no reason for an escalation with Israel at this time, and then Russia, which has an ongoing presence and interest in the region, has also now called on cooler heads to prevail. The Russian Foreign Affairs Ministry said that Israel does have the right to protect itself and its borders, but that they hope, quote, the actions taking place will not violate UN Resolution 1701, end quote. That and that Russia expects UNIFIL to fulfill its mission. They further called on both sides to show restraint and responsibility, avoiding provocative actions and statements which could escalate tensions on the Israel-Lebanon border. So far, only legal escalations have occurred then, with Lebanon's Foreign Minister Basil saying he intends to submit an official complaint against Israel's operation with the United Nations Security Council. And Israel mounted similar threats regarding the existence of the tunnels in the first place. Just a few weeks after intense fighting with Gaza exploded, Hamas officials are now threatening Israel with resumed violence along the Gaza border should the ceasefire discussions between Hamas and Israel begin to stall. One of the terror group's leaders, Fatih Hamad, said that, quote, if Israel won't stand by the understandings reached, the incendiary balloons and the violent border demonstrations will resume, end quote. Such agreements include allowing Qatari payments to Hamas, increasing the maritime fishing border around the Gaza Strip, and establishing new United Nations-backed aid projects. But it's worth noting that while the protests are certainly smaller, the violent border demonstrations in Gaza never stopped. And now former Defense Minister Avigdor Lieberman, as well as many independent organizations in Israel, are arguing that Israel has backed itself into a corner. Lieberman, who resigned over the ceasefire with Hamas last month, said that, quote, up until March 30th, we hadn't thought about transferring money and fuel, but Hamas applied pressure through their much of return protests, and economically it paid off for them. Since then, Hamas's support in the Gaza Strip has increased, and as far as we're concerned, this is a catastrophe. We came out looking like complete losers, end quote. Similarly, a group of Israeli mothers from southern Israel are now taking action at the International High Court of Justice, calling for an end to Qatari funding for Hamas. They said that the money should be withheld until Hamas is either out of power or can guarantee that the money won't be used to escalate terror. Until that time, they call the transfer of funds, quote, extremely unreasonable and blatantly illegal, end quote. This also comes just days ahead of a scheduled vote at the United Nations General Assembly on a United States-sponsored resolution condemning Hamas's violence, especially in the wake of the hundreds of rockets fired indiscriminately into Israel in early November. Outgoing United Nations Ambassador Nikki Haley tweeted that, quote, Countries must now ask themselves, are they for or against Hamas's violence? The choice is clear for the United States. We hope it will be for the rest of the UN as well, end quote. The European Union is also expected to back the resolution. Moving on, the United Nations Security Council met on Tuesday for a closed-door discussion over Iran's missile testing program. France and the United Kingdom had called for the meeting in light of Iran's testing last week of medium-range ballistic missiles, which have the ability to carry nuclear warheads and strike anywhere in the Middle East and even parts of Europe. France said it was concerned by the missile tests, describing them as, quote, provocative and destabilizing, and they echoed United States Secretary of State Mike Pompeo's remarks that it was in violation of Resolution 2231. Likewise, British Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt called the missile test, quote, provocative, threatening, and inconsistent, end quote, and said that Britain was determined that it should cease. Iran, however, has claimed that its missile testing program is not in any violation, as it is defensive in nature. But in light of the developments, Brian Hook, the senior policy advisor to the U.S. Secretary of State and United States Special Representative for Iran, took the opportunity to repeatedly call on the EU to reinstate sanctions on Iran over these actions. Missile testing such as this, as well as other bad faith Iranian actions, are also the quoted reasons President Donald Trump withdrew from the JCPOA in the first place. On Monday evening, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu also met with United States Secretary of State Mike Pompeo in Brussels, where the two lit Hanukkah candles ahead of their closed meeting. 
In the meet, the two primarily discussed Iran and other regional issues like Operation Northern Shield and Hezbollah's massive rocket arsenal. And Netanyahu was accompanied by the head of the Mossad, the head of the National Security Council, and the Israeli military secretary. All right, moving on. Ahead of the Hanukkah celebrations this week, the United Nations General Assembly in New York last Friday approved six anti-Israel resolutions out of the typical 20 or so that are passed every year by the UNGA against the Jewish state. But this time around, again, none of the six resolutions condemned Hamas or other terror groups, and indeed two of them completely ignored any Jewish ties to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem's old city. The Temple Mount, of course, is the site of the first and second Jewish temple, and it's considered the holiest place on earth for Jews. But the temple's ruins today lie beneath the Haram al-Sharif Mosque, which is why Jews worldwide come to pray at the western wall uh, of the Temple Mount complex. No Jewish prayers allowed by Muslims or Israeli officials atop the uh, Temple Mount, and offenders are often arrested. Now, the two main resolutions regarding Jerusalem passed with around 150 votes each, and they both condemn Israel's sovereignty in Jerusalem. Additionally, neither of the resolution's texts acknowledge Jewish or Christian ties to the Temple Mount, calling it only by the Muslim name Haram al-Sharif. Noah Furman, the Israeli Deputy Permanent Representative at the UN, said that, quote, this omission was deliberate, and shows yet another instance of the Palestinians' refusal to recognize the proven historical connection between Judaism, Christianity, the Temple Mount, and Jerusalem as a whole. The international community must stop participating in such blatant denial of history. You must not permit these blatant attempts to delegitimize Israel, end quote. As for the other four resolutions, they challenged Israel's annexation of the Golan Heights, called on Israel to return to negotiations on the basis of pre-1967 borders, and shored up support for Palestinian committees and divisions within the UN. Only the United States, Canada, and Australia voted with Israel against all six resolutions, with United States Deputy Political Coordinator Leslie Orderman saying that this trend is unacceptable. He said, quote, Again, we see resolutions that are quick to condemn all manner of Israeli actions, but say almost nothing about Palestinian terrorist attacks against innocent civilians. This is particularly acute now, when the rocket attacks on November 12th saw more projectiles fired on a single day than on any day since 2014, end quote. To that end, Orderman also announced the first ever standalone resolution condemning Hamas and other militant terror groups in the area, and it's slated for a vote at the General Assembly on Friday. The EU is expected to support the text. Prime Minister Netanyahu chaired a meeting of the Ministerial Committee on Violence Against Women on Wednesday morning, and in his opening remarks, he equated violence against women with terrorism, and he said that the government needs to help women victims of violence, while at the same time giving a, quote, punch to the face to abusive husbands. Netanyahu vowed to take the issue seriously, saying, quote, there is a lot of work to be done, end quote, and the committee met one day after a nationwide women's strike on Tuesday to shed light on the issue and demand that the government implement a national plan to reduce violence against women. I know that the first thing they want to, the government to give the money they promised. They promised 250 million shekels. And it was promised a year ago, after they already built the program and wrote everything how to deal with uh, this violence. Uh, but this money never arrived. The strike was organized in the wake of last week's murder of two young girls, 13-year-old Silvana Tsegai and 16-year-old Yara Ayub and their deaths bring the total number of women and girls murdered in Israel this past year to 24, marking a dramatic increase in domestic violence. The call to protest was answered by tens of thousands of men and women who gathered at Tel Aviv's Rabin Square Tuesday evening for a demonstration. This was preceded by a day of marches and events in major cities and intersections around the country, and a nationwide initiative which saw women leave work at 10 a.m. for 24 minutes in honor of those killed. The call to protest received overwhelming support from over 300 Israeli institutions as well, including the Knesset, the Office of the President of Israel, local municipalities, the Hisadrut Labor Federation, Israeli universities, and women's organizations who pushed the issue to the top of the public agenda. Yeah, I think this is a very important moment where we all need to unite together, women from all spectrum of the political uh, uh, sides, from all different shapes and uh, uh, parts of the Israeli society. I think this has a, a very uh, strong calling uh, to give some kind of strength and empowerment for women who are in this vicious, vicious cycle of violence in order to give them a little bit of strength so that they are able to get out of this uh, uh, vicious Cycle. In the wake of yesterday's police announcement, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu has now been recommended for indictments on charges of bribery, graft, breach of trust, and more in cases 1,000, 2,000, and now 4,000. 
Attorney General Avichai Mandelblit now only has to review the three cases presented to his office, after which he'll give the final say on whether or not to indict. But Prime Minister Netanyahu continues to denounce the investigations, calling them a baseless witch hunt. In fact, the Prime Minister argued that the police had, quote, decided what the outcome would be and leaked their conclusions, end quote, a full year before the investigation was completed. But Prime Minister Netanyahu continues to denounce the investigations, calling them a baseless witch hunt. In fact, the Prime Minister argued that the police had, quote, decided what the outcome would be and leaked their conclusions, end quote, a full year before the investigation was completed. <laughs> The Prime Minister even just posted a Hanukkah greeting video in which he brushes off the cases against him in an ill-timed joke. It's unclear when the video was filmed, but in it, Netanyahu approaches a man in a donut shop where he jokes about having the police called on him for no reason. The man he's speaking to quips, it's case 5000, to which the premier responds, leave it, who's even counting? <laughs> but the Lachav 433 anti-corruption unit, which conducted the investigations against Netanyahu, his wife Sarah, and Bezik controlling shareholder Shaul Elevich and his wife Iris, have now presented supposed mounds of evidence that they say can take the Prime Minister and all the other suspects to trial. Primarily the two states' witnesses, Nir Chefetz and Ilan Yeshua, who provided supposed physical evidence and testimony to police. Chefetz, who was Netanyahu's former media advisor, allegedly acted as a go-between for Netanyahu and those at Bezik Telecommunications and Walla News. As for Yeshua, Walla News' CEO, the case essentially began thanks in part to his testimony. He was instructed by his boss and now suspect in case 4000 Shaul Elevich to destroy his phone, and with it, any evidence of impropriety. Instead, he took his phone to an attorney, eventually releasing it to police with supposed great relief to be rid of it. Regardless of the outcome, however, opposition MKs like Tsipi Livni charge that the Prime Minister's rhetoric is damaging the state confidence in the police, tweeting, quote, If you're ever in distress and need the police, remember it's Netanyahu that is trying to weaken this agency, end quote. Thankfully, however, the country's faith in the justice system hasn't been shaken quite to that extent just yet. I do have faith in our justice system, and I believe that if Bibi is guilty, then he will be brought to justice. I think there's something According to Syrian and Russian news reports, an Israeli warplane and four missiles have just been shot down over Syrian airspace following an alleged attempted attack on Thursday evening, November the 29th. Syria's Sana news agency said that Syrian air defenses were activated and thwarted an Israeli attack. أكد مصدر عسكري أن وسائط دفاع جوي تصدت لأهداف معادية فوق منطقة الكسوة وأسقطتها دون أن تحقق أي هدف من أهدافها وذكرت مصادر للأخبار أن دفاعات الجوية تصدت للعدوان وأفشلته ولم يستطع رغم كثافته من تحقيق أي هدف من أهدافه حيث تم التعامل مع جميع الأهداف المعادية وإسقاطها Kiswa, the supposed target, is home to multiple alleged military installations belonging to Hezbollah and Iranian militias near Damascus, just 50 kilometers north of Israel. Assuming this is true, it certainly wouldn't be outside of Israel's character to target this area, and attacks aimed at Kiswa in the past have also been attributed to Israel, including an attack just this past May in which 15 people were killed. But Israeli officials have rejected all such claims, both of the recent attack and of the downing of an Israeli aircraft. In fact, according to the IDF spokesperson's unit, a Syrian surface-to-air missile was fired, but into an open area of the Israeli Golan. The spokesperson continued, however, that, quote, at this stage, it's not clear whether a missile actually landed in our territory, end quote. As if to inflame tensions further, though, this attack comes as Israeli relations with Russia remain damaged over the downing of a Russian aircraft in September. Russia responded by demanding more cooperation and intelligence sharing from Israel, as well as by installing S-300 surface-to-air defense systems in Syria. 
but Israel has indicated that it will not stop operations vital to keeping Iran and Iranian proxies at bay. Just hours before this alleged attack, for example, an Iranian Boeing 747 airliner reportedly smuggled weapons to Iranian proxy forces via the first ever direct flight from Tehran to Beirut. All right, now, last night marked the first night of Hanukkah this year, and hundreds gathered to mark the occasion outside the Pittsburgh Tree of Life Synagogue, where 11 congregants were murdered on October 27th. The synagogue held a public lighting of their menorah out front, and also took a moment to honor the victims of the attack with a makeshift memorial. Thousands visited to pay their respects, pray, sing, and otherwise just be present for the lighting of the menorah in solidarity with the Jewish community. Thousands visited to pay their respects, pray, sing, and otherwise just be present for the lighting of the menorah in solidarity with the Jewish community. Rabbi Myers, who was conducting the services at the Tree of Life Synagogue at the time of the mass shooting, said, quote, I don't think that there are enough adjectives to describe the community's support, end quote. And indeed, in the months since the massacre, many public figures, Jewish and not, have also offered their support, especially as anti-Semitism globally is on the rise. Israeli basketball player Omri Kaspi, for example, said he felt safe in the United States, but was confronted with violent protesters in Europe and sometimes played with no fans just for safety reasons. New England Patriots receiver Julian Edelman also went public with an Israeli baseball cap for a shout-out to Pittsburgh after a victory over the Green Bay Packers. In that same interview, he said, quote, I'm proud of who I am and what I am. Just to let these victims know, we're all with you. This is a very tough time for you, I can't even imagine. But you have support, end quote. On a related note, in an equally somber but beautiful gesture, the family of murdered Israeli advocate Ari Fold was joined by the woman Fold rescued for a candlelighting ceremony of their own at the scene of the attack in Gush Etzion. After being stabbed, Fold ran after the terrorist and shot him in order to save the rest of the people in the area. It was thanks to this action that the falafel shop worker Hila Peretz was spared a similar fate. She was quoted saying, quote, The man that was killed, Ari Fold, really saved my life. He's not just a hero, he gave his life for me, end quote. Meanwhile, Robert Bowers, the shooter in the Pittsburgh attack, pleaded not guilty to murder and hate crimes charges. He remains in jail without bail. Moving now to Jerusalem, the holy city has just erected one of the world's largest, if not the largest, menorahs in the world, measuring over 35 feet tall and over 180 feet wide. And the massive Hanukkah candelabra sits atop the Hadar Mall in the center of the old city. The idea behind the initiative is that residents can see the massive structure from any spot around the capital, where it will light up all eight days of Hanukkah. Construction took days and dozens of workers to complete, and the menorah is built out of metal and lit up using LED lights. On Sunday, Jerusalem's new mayor, Moshe Lyon, lit the first candle in an official ceremony too, and CEO of the Hadar Mal, Eyal Skoza, said, quote, The holy city of Jerusalem, which spreads light to all the world, will enjoy literally spreading the light this festival, end quote. And he called on all the residents of Israel to visit the capital during the Hanukkah holiday to see the beautiful menorah for themselves. On a related note, the holiday season is back, and what better way is there to welcome in the month of Christmas than with thousands gathering in Bethlehem outside the Church of the Nativity, where Jesus is said to have been born. While thousands of Christians and tourists alike came to light the giant Christmas tree located outside the church, including both the Palestinian Authority Prime Minister Rami Amdala and the top official of the Catholic Church in the Holy Land, Father Francesco Patton. <laughs> Earlier on Saturday, Father Patton led a service at the Nativity Church as well. Prime Minister Hamdala, on the other hand, took time at the event to denounce alleged Israeli plans to, quote, uproot us and strip us from our civilization and history, end quote. That being said, the population today in Bethlehem, where the church resides, is about 2% Arab Christian, with the vast majority of the remaining population being Muslim Palestinians. In 1948, though, Christians made up 85% of the demographics, whereas by 1967, they had already declined in the city to 46%. These numbers have been mostly attributed to stress from the Israeli blockade in addition to incidents of violence between Muslims and Christians in the area. But for the most part, relations between the two have been stable, if not positive. As for the annual ceremony Saturday evening, it was filled with a display of fireworks and many other festivities, and the event sparks a month of Christmas celebrations leading up to the traditional midnight mass on Christmas Eve, also at the Church of the Nativity. Finally, Hanukkah also begins tonight with Israelis and Jews worldwide lighting the first of eight daily candles at sundown. And in accordance with the Festival of Lights, get ready for a host of fun activities and events across Israel as well, including sporting events, concerts, night runs, and a free Hanukkah parade tomorrow afternoon in Jerusalem. So happy holidays to all, and have fun. 24 rare gold coins and a 900-year-old gold earring were just found in the port of Kesaria, and the items were discovered in a bronze pot between stones in a side of a well. 
An archaeologist say that the artifact's owners may have died, unfortunately, in a massacre by a crusader army back in the end of the 11th century, around 1101. <laughs> ורוצה גורל מת מכאבי בטן כמה שבועות אחרי זה, והאח שלו יצא עם הצבא שלו, צר על קיסריה, ואחרי כמה ימי לחימה פרצים ביצורים של קיסריה. לפי העדויות, רוב התושבים הקמים פשוט נהרגו. מי שהסתיר את המטמון הזה התכוון שברגע שהדברים נהרגו קצת לגזור ולהציאתו החוצה, וזה לא קרה. The items were discovered during an excavation at the Kasaria National Park, and Dr. Robert Kuhl, a coin expert at the Israel Antiquities Authority, said that the coins weren't common, and they hint at trade relations between Kasaria and Constantinople. כשאנחנו מוציאים מטבעות זהב, מישהו הסתיר בכוונה את הקופה שלו, את החיסכון שלו, את האושר שלו, ולא חזר עליו. He added that one coin was equal to a farmer's annual salary at the time, so whoever owned it must have been rich or involved in trade. The bronze pot in which the items were found is also a treasure in itself as well. קיסריה לא מפסיקה להפתיע, קיסריה לא מפסיקה לרגש. מה שקורה כאן היום כרגע, זה שאנחנו כל פעם, אחת לכמה זמן, מקבלים דרישת שלום מהעבר, מההיסטוריה של המקום הזה, מגלים עוד רקע, עוד סיפור על מה שהיה כאן פעם. The Edmund Rothschild Foundation sponsors the multi-year Kisaria project in cooperation with the Kisaria Development Corporation, the Antiquities Authority, and the Israel Nature and Parks Authority. And the latest discovery was found near the location of two other treasures of the same period, including a pot of gold and silver jewelry found in the 1960s, and a collection of bronze vessels found in the 1990s. The treasures are all currently displayed at the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. All right, that's it for this week's weekly review. Remember to follow us on Facebook for more news at Israel English News and, of course, on Twitter at ILTV News. I'm Aaron Porras. Thank you for watching.